Puyo Puyo has had it rough, especially here in the West. In the early days of the series, only four titles ever got released outside of Japan. The first game got reskinned three different times as Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bee Machine, Kirby's Avalanche, and Quirks. Using a more popular IP as a marketing hook probably helped these versions sell better in the short term. But I think that in the long run it was ultimately hurtful because it kept Puyo Puyo from being recognized as its own game. The second game got ported to nearly every platform imaginable, but the only one of these to get released outside of Japan was... the Neo Geo Pocket Color version, somehow. At least they kept the original cast this time. Compile went on to release two more sequels and an absurd number of spin-offs, but not a single one of these games received a Western release. But once Sega bought the rights to the series, they did bring over a Puyo Pop, also known as Mina de Puyo Puyo. This was then followed up with a full English dub for Puyo Pop Fever. A ridiculously hammy dub, perhaps? But I think we all love it for that. But that was the last time the West would get to see the series before going dark. For the next 13 years, every new Puyo Puyo game released remains exclusive to Japan. In 2017, Puyo Puyo Tetris received an updated re-release as the Nintendo Switch launch title. This port was mostly the same as the 2014 last-gen version. This was DLC included, some tweaks to the online play, and... an English localization. After 13 years, we finally got a chance to play Puyo Puyo in the West again. And this time, it was a massive hit. It almost seemed like the stars had aligned to the timing of a Nintendo Switch launch title, budget price tag, free demo on the eShop, and heavy marketing push all catapulted this game to smash prior sales records for the series. So we finally got a new Puyo Puyo game in the West, it was a bestseller, and everyone lived happily ever after. End of video, right? Right? Well, despite its commercial success, the game had quite a few problems. If you bought this game because you were interested in playing Puyo Puyo competitively, you were about to be faced with the worst online experience imaginable. The big gimmick behind Puyo Puyo Tetris is that Puyo Puyo players and Tetris players can play against each other in a hybrid versus format. How does this work, you might ask? It doesn't! Mixed versus is an absolutely horrendous mode that Puyo Puyo players and Tetris players both hated. Usually when people talk about this mode, they talk about how poor the balancing was. I could say the words, slight disadvantage, play a sitcom laugh track, and those of you who remember this era could reminisce on the funny meme. But I think the fact that the discourse around this game kept fixating on balance only ever distracted from a much bigger problem I had with Puyo Puyo Tetris. I want to play a normal game of Puyo Puyo against another Puyo Puyo player. Mixed versus is bad. I don't want to play it. I just want to play Puyo Puyo. That's all I want to do. And since this is the only version of Puyo Puyo that is available in the West right now, I have to try to do it here. But I can't just play a normal game of Puyo Puyo, because Puyo Puyo Tetris does not offer any form of matchmaking filters. It has just one ranked queue both games are forced to share. Given that Tetris is a vastly more popular game than Puyo Puyo, what do you think ended up happening? Over in the Japanese community, Many of the more serious competitive players were quick to drop this game and go right back to Puyo Puyo Chronicle. But since that game was never released here, we couldn't go join them. So if Japan already left for greener pastures, and the game hasn't yet established much of a competitive scene in the West, where am I going to find anyone who actually plays Puyo Puyo? Of course Puyo Puyo was outnumbered to a point where at least 9 times out of 10, I'd go into the queue and get matched against a Tetris player. My experience trying to play this game was to enter matchmaking, see a Tetris player, hit B to cancel, and try again for 10 to 15 minutes until I finally find a Puyo Puyo opponent. We'd get to play one round, and then it's back to the queue to repeat this agonizing process. Don't ask me why I ever put up with this to begin with, because I honestly couldn't tell you. But despite how frustrating this was at the time, this is seen as a temporary problem we hopefully wouldn't have to suffer through forever. What mattered was that Puyo Puyo made it to the West, and it sold really, really well, and that was enough to give fans hope for the future. At some point, Sega will release the next game in the series, it'll presumably be a standalone game without Tetris, and hopefully it gets localized too. We'll just have to wait patiently for now, just hold on until the next game comes out. Meanwhile over in Japan, Sega had started running a series of official tournaments for the competitive scene. 
but using Puyo Puyo Tetris for these events meant that they had to pay licensing fees to the Tetris company, which they didn't want to have to keep doing forever. In mid-2018, a few months after the tournament circuit had began, Sega announced Puyo Puyo Esports. This is a modified version of Puyo Puyo Tetris' engine rebuilt for competitive play. It featured a more accurate implementation of the classic Sue rule set, the return of fever mode, and numerous quality of life fixes. A later update would even implement spectator support, making it finally possible to stream online tournaments, something we couldn't do back in PPT. But Puyo Puyo Esports would not feature a story mode, or any form of single player content at all. It wouldn't even have any new assets, nearly everything was reused from the mobile spinoff, Puyo Puyo Quest. This was a very quick and dirty budget title that was rushed out for use at tournaments, and the name Puyo Puyo Esports was meant to reflect that. What was most concerning, though, was that Sega said nothing about any plans to bring this game over to the West. If the game is just meant for competitive play, and the West hadn't yet developed much of a competitive scene at this point in time, is it even worth trying to sell over here? On the bright side, the Switch being region-free meant that those of us who were really serious about this game could at least set up a Japanese eShop account to buy it there. Which is exactly what I ended up doing. But even if the most die-hard fans had a means of playing it, the lack of an official localization was a tragedy that left the community uncertain about the future. It's going to be hard to bring new players into the scene if they have to jump through hoops to import this game. Petitions were circulated to beg Sega for a localization, but as more and more time passed with no response, it was beginning to look like there was no hope. But nearly a year later, a miracle happened. Sega finally announced that the game would be released in the West as Puyo Puyo Champions. Bringing this game to the West was the best thing that ever happened to the competitive community. After how much pain and suffering it was to try to play Puyo Puyo Tetris Online, finally we had a game that was just... functional. A game that actually let me play Puyo Puyo against other Puyo Puyo players, and not make me want to... Violin! ...myself in the process. The quality of life fixes really went a long way too. We went from the worst online to the best online. I can't undersell just how much of a breath of fresh air Champions was. I look back on 2019 as the golden era for online Puyo Puyo. But it still didn't feel like we had truly made it yet. As I said before, this is just a quick and dirty budget title. Its selling point was working online play, but the caveat was literally nothing else to do offline. No story, no other game modes besides Sue and Fever, nothing like the hefty amount of bonus content that previous games were typically packed with. As much as I do like Puyo Puyo Champions for just having working online, that is a low bar. This is a game aimed squarely at existing hardcore competitive players, but it isn't a game that can hook new audiences to make them fall in love with this game and want to start playing competitively. Because at this point in time, the most frustrating part of Puyo Puyo Champions was trying to convince new players to buy it. For now though, a game with playable online is at least a step in the right direction. It's enough to make me happy. And the fact that Sega was willing to take a chance on localizing this game was seen as an extremely promising sign for the future. The assumption was that this game had been rushed out to keep the competitive scene busy, while Sega would work on a bigger main series title later. So, when are we going to get that bigger main series title? And what should we expect from it? Before Puyo Puyo Tetris made it west, there were three games known as the Anniversary Trilogy. Puyo Puyo 15th Anniversary, Puyo Puyo 20th Anniversary, and Puyo Puyo Chronicle. All of these games were absolutely packed with tons of game modes and bonus content. Chronicle's story mode even took the form of a full-length puzzle JRPG. I consider these three to be the absolute best games in the series, and I think there are a lot of fans who would probably agree with me. If you never tried them, they all have translation patches, so go see what the West has been missing out on. Given that these anniversary games were released every five years, it seems like a safe bet that another game like these could be released in 2021 to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the series. And if that game gets localized, it will be a dream come true for Western fans. Most of the community bought into this assumption, hyping up the idea that 30th will grant all of our wishes in due time. So we sat tight and waited for 30th. But in 2020, a year ahead of schedule, we got a different announcement. Puyo Puyo Tetris 2. To say that this announcement was divisive would be an understatement. But I will be fair here. When I say divisive, I do mean that not everyone was quite as upset as I was. The community was actually very split on this news. To more casual audiences who liked the first game and didn't notice or care about the problems that bothered hardcore players, this was simply more of a thing they liked. To people who might care more about Tetris than they do about Puyo Puyo, which is most of the West, honestly, here's your Tetris.
But to those of us who are waiting all this time for a standalone main game, to those of us who wanted to see something the West hasn't gotten to experience yet, to those of us still harboring emotional trauma from the first game's abysmal online, to those of us who just want Puyo Puyo to be recognized as its own thing and not remain shackled to Tetris forever, to those of us who thought for sure 30th was going to deliver, <sighs> I just want to ask, why do we even need a second crossover? Once the game came out, most people who had defended the announcement were pretty quickly silenced, because boy was it a disastrous launch. The game was plagued with bugs and technical issues. Champions had fixed almost all of the problems I had with PPT1, but somehow this game managed to roll back most of those fixes and then break even more things in the process. The most glaring problem was the lag. I had absolutely no idea how a 2D puzzle game could even have this much slowdown. But while bugs could be patched, and some of them eventually were, what really stood out to me about this game was that it was the exact same as the first game. The only new content was an adaptation of Puyo Puyo Chronicles skill battle, but it's a pretty badly butchered one. Perhaps Sega wanted to fool the West into thinking that's new since we never got Chronicle, but I refuse to count it. So again I just ask, why did we need the same game twice? What was the point? The game was such a mess that both the Western and Japanese competitive communities were unanimous in uninstalling it and going right back to Puyo Puyo Champions. Ain't no way we're dealing with that lag. Even the Tetris players hated it too and went back to Effect or Tetrio. Let's all just... pretend this game never happened. A year passed. The fabled 30th anniversary came, but no news on a new game. The dream was dead. We'll just keep playing Champions, I guess. But as more time passed, things began to falter. Tournaments that continued to run Puyo Puyo Champions were struggling with low turnout. Burnout was at an all-time high, and morale was at an all-time low. A new debate popped up in the community. Should we maybe try Puyo Puyo Tetris 2 again? They patched to be, uh, slightly less laggy? Good enough? I mean, sure, the lag isn't actually fully fixed, and the lobby filters still don't work, and timing still aren't faithful to original suit rules, Japan still isn't playing this game either, and even Sega themselves don't use this game for their own official tournaments, but... Um... You can play as Sonic? Snark aside, the concern was that new players weren't going to pick up Puyo Puyo Champions. Trying to explain to people that they bought the wrong game and they should actually go get the really bare-bones budget title instead was a hard sell to those not in the know. Is it worth putting up with all of PPT2's problems in the hopes that maybe we might get a few more players this way? You can probably tell by my tone here where I stand on this issue. Even after the patches, Puyo Puyo Tetris 2 still has serious problems that make it absolutely unacceptable for competitive play and cannot be replaced by Puyo Puyo Champions. Please do not ever use this game for tournaments. But hold on a sec, before you rush to the comment section to argue with me, the more important point I want to make is this. This divide never should have happened to begin with. Splitting an already dwindling player base across two different games was the real problem here. A problem we wouldn't have had to worry about if Sega hadn't released such a divisive game. The way I saw it, this divide only threatened to kill both games. If bringing Puyo Puyo Champions to the West was the best thing that ever happened to the competitive scene, splitting the player base was the worst thing that ever happened to the competitive scene. Puyo Puyo simply cannot afford to compete with itself like this. If 30th had happened instead, we wouldn't be in this predicament. We'd all be playing 30th and the player base would be much healthier. But since we don't have 30th, I tried to just work with what we had and continue pushing for Puyo Puyo Champions events. I ran the PPC bracket at Combo Breaker 2022 hoping that, if I could make this work, maybe things could get better. My ultimate long-term dream for this game was to see the scene grow to a point where we could keep running offline events on a regular basis and get people to show up for them. I put all of my blood, sweat, and tears into making this tournament happen, hoping it could be the first of many. I had a lot of fun running this event, and I wanted nothing more than to be able to do another, but the low turnout and general lack of enthusiasm convinced me that there just isn't a path forward anymore. We can't get the numbers to justify trying to run more events like this. Nobody is taking the game seriously in the state that it's in, and that's not going to change at this rate. I was convinced that the only way we could ever turn this around would have to come from Sega. If we can't get people to show up for Puyo Puyo Champions, then Sega needs to release a game that people will actually play. But if the problem as I see it is that the player base has become too divided, can releasing another game actually undo that? At this point, what I really want to see out of a new game is a healthier player base. Obviously, the first step towards that goal is to have just one definitive game, 
the perfect entry point that I can wholeheartedly recommend to new players without any caveats. But there's one key feature that I think that game needs in order to not only stabilize the player base, but grow it. The divide between Puyo Puyo Champions and Puyo Puyo Tetris 2 is one factor that's splitting up players, but there's another problem to consider here. Puyo Puyo Champions is available on Nintendo Switch, Steam, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. But the Switch version is the only one you'll easily find players on. If you bought the game on Steam, you're going to have to rely on Discord pings instead of in-game matchmaking. And if you bought the game on PS4 or Xbox One, you just wasted $10. It's honestly quite tragic that 3 out of the 4 platforms this game is released on are deserted. The runaway success of Puyo Puyo Tetris as a Nintendo Switch launch title, as well as the console's overall popularity in Japan where Puyo Puyo is much bigger, has entrenched the Switch as the primary platform for Puyo Puyo. But I don't think the other platforms are dead simply because no one else who owns those systems wants to try Puyo Puyo. I think it's simply a chicken and egg problem where no one will waste their time sitting in the queue because they already know nobody else was going to be there. In fact, I know this is the case, because I've talked to a number of players who have told me that they would love to get into this game, but can't because they don't play on Switch. I think that's especially a problem for the West. Steam is arguably more popular here, but Japan isn't playing on Steam and we still need access to Japanese opponents because the game itself isn't popular here. Steam represents a pretty large chunk of the Western market, a chunk that cannot enjoy this game to the fullest right now. In the past, I've largely focused on FGC outreach, partly because that's my own background, but also because I think that piggybacking off of FTC events and infrastructure is the best opportunity to get the ball rolling on Puyo Puyo brackets. That's why I really wanted to push for Combo Breaker 2022. But most of the FTC prefers PS4, which is also a no-go for Puyo Puyo, so it's been hard to reach many of those players. And then Xbox? Um... I actually don't know anyone who plays on Xbox. But I'm sure someone out there does? Leave a comment and say hi if you're an Xbox player. Anyway, the solution is one that many new multiplayer games released today have been adopting, cross-platform multiplayer. Instead of players only being able to match against opponents on the same platform as them, allow everyone to play against everyone regardless of what they're on. Now every platform is playable, attracting more players to alternative platforms and growing a wider matchmaking pool that benefits everyone. The advent of crossplay is a massive boon for every game that supports it. In fact, I would go as far as to say that any developer releasing a multiplayer game in this day and age without crossplay is making a huge mistake. It's current year. There are no more excuses left to not do this. If Puyo Puyo could get crossplay, I truly believe this could revolutionize the future of the game, bring a lot of new players in, and significantly improve the speed and quality of matchmaking. This is by far the single most important thing the game needs. So, Sega. That's what I'm waiting to see. If and when you ever make another game, it better have crossplay. In 2024, roughly 3.5 years after Puyo Puyo Tetris 2, Sega finally announced a new game. Puyo Puyo Puzzle Pop. It was a long wait, but it looks like Sega might finally be delivering what fans have wanted. There's a full story mode, anniversary mode to making a return, and most importantly, there's no Tetris in it. Puyo Puyo gets to take center stage as its own standalone game. But as I just said, there's still one thing I really need to see here. Are we getting crossplay? No. Not only is there no crossplay, the game will be exclusive to Apple Arcade. Apple Arcade. Really? Apple Arcade? All this time I've been asking for Sega to bring this game to a wider audience through crossplay, and instead they lock it away on a subscription service nobody asked for. In response to this news, I put out a quick little reaction video where I basically just said, wow, that really sucks. And while I've been known to drop more than a few controversial takes over the years, this is the one time when I thought surely everyone would be on the same page here. Surely, no one is going to try to tell me that this exclusivity deal is actually a good thing, right? There's no way anyone would try to say that, would they? Like, I swear, if I get even one comment telling me exclusivity is good, I will scream. In hindsight, I wish I had gone into more detail and put more emphasis on the importance of crossplay in that video. I kind of rushed it out because I really thought this time it wouldn't be controversial to say, crossplay good, exclusivity bad. But maybe it's on me for not getting the first half of that point across well enough. If I had to make that video all over again, well, I'd make this video. That's what this video is now. Anyway, to those of you who broke my heart in the comment section, I want to talk about what happened next once the game came out. The question on my mind wasn't, will this game have a healthy online player base? I was certain it wouldn't. I just wondered how long it would take to die off. If I was a betting man, I would have said maybe two weeks tops. But on day one, I was already hearing some rather interesting reports. 
if you go into the rank queue, you will in fact find opponents, rather quickly even. But you might notice some weird coincidences. Every single player has a name in the form of adjective noun. They all play very slowly. They hardly even chain at all. They don't actually seem to know how to play the game. And yet somehow, they always have a rating very close to yours. Weird, huh? Who are these people? Why are they all so similar? If you haven't figured it out, these are just bots pretending to be human opponents. And they're very bad at pretending. Sega faked the online. It's not real. I've been pissed off at a lot of things Sega has done over the years, but this might be the single most disgusting thing I've ever seen from them, because I see this as a form of lying to the player. If I go online to play against human opponents, I want actual humans. A fake match against a counterfeit player that isn't even fighting back is just wasting my time, and lying to me about it makes it that much worse. Why would they do that? Did they think no one would notice? The lack of any actual humans to be found is how we know that no one is actually playing Puzzle Pop. This game flopped. I have to suspect that Sega knew from the beginning that making this game exclusive to Apple Arcade would make it dead on arrival. They knew this would happen, so they tried to cover it up with bots. But if they knew that exclusivity would kill this game, why didn't they just release it on a platform that wouldn't be dead? If we had crossplay, even the people who wanted to play on Apple Arcade, all three of them, could have been able to find opponents too. Actual human opponents, that is. All they had to do was not make this game exclusive. All they had to do was give it crossplay. This game genuinely could have been good. It otherwise delivered a lot of what I've been asking for. But nothing else this game does means anything if nobody's playing it to begin with. If a tree falls in the forest and nobody's using the subscription service to hear it, does it make a sound? And so that brings us to today. At the time of recording this video, Puzzle Pop is dead and there's been no word from Sega on any plans to put a game on platforms people might actually play. The success of Puyo Puyo Tetris in the West should have led the series to new heights, but... Here we are seven years later and what do we have to show for it? We got a budget title so devoid of content that I get yelled at for trying to convince anyone to play it. We got a bugged cut and paste rehash of the first game. We got a game that's so dead they had to fake the online. What went wrong? This is the part of the video where I'm about to don my tinfoil hat and drop the most controversial takes that I know will get people arguing with me in the comments section. If you weren't already mad at me for what I've said so far, you probably will be by the end. Just hear me out and let me finish before you leave those comments, alright? I've talked about the problems with each game individually, but now I want to step back and look at the bigger picture. I see all these issues as symptoms of a deeper underlying problem with the way that Sega is handling the series. I have two questions I want to ask, and a theory that I believe answers both of them. Why did Sega make a second crossover instead of a standalone game? Why did Sega make Puzzle Pop exclusive to Apple Arcade? If you want, you can pause the video and take a moment to think about these questions yourself. I believe that the answer to both of these questions is that Sega doesn't have faith in this series to succeed on its own. I've been talking up 15th, 20th, and Chronicle as the absolute pinnacle of perfection, the games that I desperately want to see a successor to. But... Sales-wise, each game sold worse than the last. These numbers paint a pretty dismal picture of declining series. Chronicle in particular was always doomed to fail just for the awful timing of a 3DS exclusive at the very end of the system's lifespan. For Sega, it doesn't matter how good the game is if nobody's buying it. What matters is that the one game that sold insanely well is the one that utilized a more popular IP to do so. But I feel that riding Tetris's coattails in this way is the kind of shallow cash grab that is ultimately damaged in the long-term future of the brand. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned that I feel the same way about how Puyo Puyo 1 was reskinned into Dr. Robotic Mean Bee Machine, Kirby's Avalanche, and Quirks. The reason I don't like these versions is because they erase Puyo Puyo's own distinct identity. Now, I'm not saying that all crossovers are always bad. Crossovers can be great when they serve to elevate both series, but I don't feel like that's what happened here. I do think the way that this particular crossover was handled has kept Puyo Puyo from getting a chance to properly be its own game, and I do blame it as a very large part of why we are where we are today. The root of the problem is just the fact that Tetris is a far bigger IP. It's not really fair to Puyo Puyo to be juxtaposed against such a massive titan of a game. Doubly so for the West, where Puyo Puyo came into this crossover as a game most players here have never even heard of. So I think what ended up happening is that a lot of players who bought Puyo Puyo Tetris never really cared to engage with the Puyo Puyo side of the game. 
They were just here to play anime Tetris. I mean, just look back to PPTs online. The fact that I never could find Puyo Puyo players is how I know what people were only ever here for. I get the impression that Puyo Puyo has only partially succeeded in the West. It has managed to attract a strong following for its colorful art style, charming characters, goofy writing, and just overall vibe. All these attributes definitely have resonated with Western audiences. But it seems like the one part that hasn't been able to take off is the actual game of Puyo Puyo, because most people would rather just play anime Tetris instead. I could even argue that Puyo Puyo is kind of difficult and confusing to new players. I think that putting these two games right next to each other only made beginners more likely to give up on the game they don't know and stick to the game they do. Maybe the strategy could have been to use Tetris as a sort of Trojan horse to first introduce Puyo Puyo to the West and afterwards follow it up with a full-size standalone Puyo Puyo game and a heavy marketing push. A standalone game will give players another opportunity to engage with Puyo Puyo on its own terms, and I think if Sega had struck while the iron was hot, it could have succeeded. At the time, I thought that was what Sega was planning to do, but that didn't end up happening. We never got the full-size standalone game. Puyo Puyo will never get a chance to properly be its own game if Sega won't ever sell it as one. First question. Why did Sega make a second crossover instead of a standalone game? I think maybe I had this backwards. Maybe Puyo Puyo is the Trojan horse for Sega to get access to the Tetris license, which they know will sell far more copies than actual Puyo Puyo games ever will. Tetris is popular. People will buy Tetris. Remember, they're coming off of Chronicle being a major commercial failure. The fact that Puyo Puyo Tetris sold significantly better than every mainline game put Sega in a difficult spot. They had a game that sold well, and a game that sold terribly. Which game did they make a sequel to? I really do think that Sega doesn't know what to do with the series now. They aren't sure if Puyo Puyo will sell on its own, but they see Tetris as a safe bet. They're well aware that many people who bought Puyo Puyo Tetris only care about Tetris, and this is the most obvious way to make sure they'll buy another game. Tetris will make money, and the money is all that matters for Sega. I have to concede that it may even be the correct decision. The decision to make a second crossover convinced me that Sega does not have faith in this series to sell on its own. That was the core thesis of an essay I wrote back in 2021, a year after Puyo Puyo Tetris 2 released and the dust had settled. Link in the description if you want to read it. I got a lot of backlash at the time, but three years later, I feel that time has proven me more and more correct in the end. But if I'm going to look back on that thesis today, I now have to explain how the game we did get, Puyo Puyo Puzzle Pop, fits into this narrative. Because I do believe this game is further proof that I was right. Second question. Why did Sega make Puzzle Pop exclusive to Apple Arcade? Well, that's easy. The answer is money. The answer is always money. Anytime a game like this goes exclusive, it's because the platform holder paid the developer money to make it exclusive. Sega isn't trying to sell this game to us. They're selling the game to Apple. Apple Arcade is a subscription service. You cannot buy a copy of Puyo Puyo Puzzle Pop, only subscribe monthly for access to it and everything else in the service's library. This means that since end users aren't paying for the game, Apple instead pays developers out of pocket to put their games on the platform. I have no way of knowing just how much Apple is paying for this. It seems like it's probably a pretty lucrative deal for Sega based on how many other exclusives they've released there. But I can draw one clear conclusion. However much money Apple offered has to be more than the amount of money Sega believed they could make by selling the game on other platforms. That has to be true, because if Sega believed they could make more money elsewhere, they would not have accepted the exclusivity deal. They would have done whatever they believed was more profitable. But they did accept the deal because they don't believe that Puyo Puyo can sell on its own. Exactly as I've been saying all along, I do believe this game has further proved my original thesis. Sega just wants whatever they think will make the most money, and they believe this is the more profitable path, even if it results in a game so dead that they have to fake the online. Hell, as long as they get Apple's money, they don't need to care if the game has a player base or not. They believe they can make more money by letting Puzzle Pop die. Sega's short-term profits have come at the expense of the long-term future of this game. In order to make a quick buck, we're left with a game nobody is actually playing. All that matters to Sega is that the check clears. I've said for years that Sega's priorities aren't in the right place, and I believe that even more strongly today than I did when I wrote my original essay. Three years later, I believe that time has proven me right all along. It brings me no joy to say that I told you so. So now the last question I have to ask is this. Where do we go from here? This is the one question I'm honestly not sure of. Puyo Puyo is in a weird limbo because it's not actually dead yet. 
A publisher the size of Sega has a pretty massive graveyard of IPs they're unlikely to ever use again. If they wanted to take Puyo Puyo out behind the shed and shoot it, they could have just done so by now. Sega must still think there is some money to be made here. They're making money off of Tetris, and they're making money off of Apple. This brings me back to what I said before about Puyo Puyo only partially succeeding in the West. I think Sega does believe that there is an audience for the characters, the world, the writing, the art style, the vibe. But it still seems like Sega has given up on trying to find an audience for the actual game, because they just don't think that's where the money is. I don't think the IP is dead for good. What I've been trying to say this whole time is that I do not believe that Sega's priorities are aligned with what this game actually needs in order to thrive. I know that rumors keep flying around that they've got something or other in store, and trust me, this time it's totally going to be so much better. But I've heard those kinds of rumors for years. Rumors mean nothing to me until I actually see it. Really, my concern isn't about whether or not Sega will make another game at all. It's whether that game will be any less half-assed than what we've gotten so far. For seven years I've been told, don't worry, the next game will be better. And every time, it wasn't. Every game we've gotten in the past seven years has come with the catch. If and when another game gets announced, my initial reaction will be to ask, what's the catch this time? I've joked in the past about how they're more likely to just make Puyo Puyo Tetris 3 at this rate. I don't even know if that's still a joke anymore, it probably is the most profitable thing they can do. Or maybe my biggest fear now is that Sega puts bots in ranked again. Mark my words, if I ever see that, I'm immediately uninstalling. I just don't have faith that we'll ever see anything that lives up to the best of what the series has had to offer in the past. Saddest of all, I don't think we'll ever see crossplay. Implanting crossplay isn't trivial to do, and I don't think Sega cares enough to invest in it no matter how badly the player base needs it. When I wrote my original essay, I secretly hoped that it would age terribly and Sega would someday prove me wrong. They didn't. Three years later, I'm making this video now hoping again that maybe this time I'll finally be proven wrong. Nothing would make me happier than to come back in a year or two and make a video about how Puyo Puyo finally got crossplay and now the game is bigger than ever. But the past seven years have made it hard to continue hoping. Kick the football, Charlie Brown. If you stuck through this video to the end, thank you for putting up with my grumpy ramblings. If you agree with even an ounce of my frustration, I urge you to share this video around and try to make some noise about it. Tell Sega that we want them to take this game more seriously. Tell Sega we need crossplay. Or even if you disagree with my position, I'm willing to have a polite conversation with you in the comments below. But before you start up a debate, I only ask one thing. Please don't be like the person who once tried to tell me that not liking Puzzle Pop's exclusivity deal means that I'm not a real Puyo Puyo fan. I made this video because I am deeply passionate about this game, and seeing a game that I love be repeatedly mismanaged again and again and again kills me inside. And I do think that if you love this game even a fraction as much as I do, surely you should also want to see Sega do better than this.